Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 12. And Hebrews is a book in the back of the New Testament. And I'll be reading chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. And this is what it says. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Pray with me. Jesus, speak to us this morning in a way that, that our hearts might hear it, might be strengthened by it. And know your presence, know your strength, know your voice. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was about 112 years ago. I was a youth director. I was a youth director and associate pastor at Dalton United Methodist Church. And I was appointed there at the same time as a senior pastor who was a great guy. I really enjoyed the time that I, that I spent with him. And he was the biggest Georgia Bulldog fan I've ever met. He was born and raised in Athens and his father taught at the university. And about half of what he talked about, somehow the Bulldogs wound up in the conversation. And it wasn't just what he talked about. In his office, he had a, a, a porcelain Ugga next to his def, desk. It was life size. And, and there Ugga was, met you every time you walked into his office. And not only next to his desk, but around the walls. I'm sure there was a picture of Jesus somewhere, but he was far outflanked by Vince Dooley. Vince Dooley or Herschel Walker was on every wall and in every corner. And when football season rolled around, he would talk about the George Bulldogs and somehow in the sermon, Herschel would appear and it would be Herschel performing some miracle. He would either walk on water or Herschel would feed 5,000 or, or something. But Hersh it was always Georgia Bulldogs. Well, the Georgia Bulldogs fan, they, they, they loved it. They loved it. They thought it was wonderful. But I don't know if you knew this or not. Not everyone is a Georgia Bulldogs fan. I don't understand how it happened. But you know what? There's some other people that love their teams as well. And I said I was in Dalton, Georgia. Well, Dalton is located about an eyelash away from Tennessee. And most of the people in that church were Tennessee fans. 
Oh, and they didn't like it at all. Fall would roll around, and that's right, I can't believe it. Talking about sports in church. Sports in church. Sports have no place in church. Shouldn't be talking about sports in church. And you know what? They had a point. Except they didn't have a point because all through the New Testament, the, the, the writers talk about sports. That there's a metaphor that sports can, can carry that, that inform the faith, that encourage the faith, that strengthen the faith, that sports has a, has a sense of purpose. So Paul will talk about, I run the race to receive the prize. It has a sense of purpose. It has a, a sense of, of discipline. And you know that word discipline, that's a big part of that word disciple. And it's the purpose and the discipline. Paul says, I box so as not punching the air. It's interesting. He doesn't talk about a boxer doesn't box. He says, I box so as not punching the air. Now, for the untrained eye, you might look at a boxing match and say, well, they're just flailing away at each other. No, it takes incredible discipline. It takes a, a, a very sharp focus. And if you're not disciplined, if you don't have a sense of focus, somebody, if, and you're in a boxing match, someone will dot your I's and cross your T's. I, I promise. Guess how I know? Oh, it's, it, it takes incredible discipline. It takes an incredible sense of purpose for boxing. Well, it's not only running. It's not only boxing. New Testament also talks about NASCAR. Well, it's not exactly NASCAR. It's, it's chariot races. And uses that as a metaphor because it takes, it has a sense of purpose. It has a sense of discipline. And it's, it's a good metaphor. And here we are in Hebrews. And he's, the, the writer is talking about, let us run with endurance. The race is set before us. <clears throat> but before we get there, he says, that we have we're a so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. A cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses. And nowadays we don't talk about people as, as being a, a cloud. That when you go to Canton Street, you don't say, well, there are a cloud of people up on Canton Street. No, we talk about them in a church. It's not called, talk, called a, a cloud, it's called a congregation. If you go to the movie theater, it's not called a a congregation, it's called an audience. If you go to a, a sporting event, it's not called an audience, it's not called a congregation in a sporting event, they're called fans. Fans. And that would be a, a more proper reading of this. We're surrounded by fans. Well, who are the fans that he's talking about? That's all of chapter 11. All of chapter 11, he talks about the people who've gone before, the great men and women of the faith. And some of the, the names you recognize, like Abraham and Isaac, other names that, like Sarah and Rahab, well, if you've read a good bit, you'll, you, you'll recognize that some names you might not recognize at all. Names like Barak and Jephthah. These aren't the people that went 98-0 and won every race that they ever ran. These are folks that fell down. These are folks that stumbled and got back up. And that's who the writer is saying. We're surrounded by people saying, you can do it. Get up, get going. Don't lose your footing. Don't lose your focus. Don't lose heart. Well, who is this letter written to? It was written about 66 AD, and it was written to Christians in Rome. It was giving the, the basics of the faith to help build them up in faith, to help teachers teach the basics of faith. But not only that, the writer knew that the, the Christians in Rome were having the toughest time of all because Nero, Nero was persecuting them. And I don't mean he was just using harsh language. 
I mean, he would sick wild animals on them, dogs to tear them to pieces. He would tie them to posts and put them in his garden and set them on fire. And not only that, he was encouraging the people of Rome to do the same thing. I mean, if, if ever you, you, you're having troubles, just, just, just point to a minority group and say, now, now those are the ones that are the real problem. And if we all focus on persecuting those, then we'll all be rid of our problems. Let's, so Nero was pointing to the Christians. And the writer is saying, you're having a hard time. I know you're having a hard time. Jesus knows what a hard time is. He knows what, it, he knows what it's like to suffer. Those who've gone before, they know what a hard time is and they've not left you alone. They are your fans. They are surrounding you. You're not alone. You're not alone. And the first thing the writer says in verse 1 is, you're not alone. Don't lose your footing. In verse 1, part B, it says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's run. Not being tripped up, not being entangled. Put aside the, the encumbrances. But run. But run. Don't lose your footing. Read a story about a woman named Linda. She was in a Honda Civic. One fall, she was making her way from Alberta, Canada, northward to Whitehorse in the Yukon region. Well, usually in the fall, the only cars that try and make their way up from, from Alberta to Whitehorse, they have four-wheel drive or they're semi-trucks. That's about the, the only ones that, that try and make their way up there in the fall. But Linda had never been there before. She was making her track from, from Alberta to Whitehorse. She found a hotel one night and she asked the person at the desk if she could have a wake-up call at five o'clock in the morning. Well, the person at the, the desk was a little surprised, but they gave her the wake-up call at five in the morning and Linda got ready. She went down to the, to the dining room to eat breakfast that morning. Well, there were only two other people there and they were truckers. They were eating breakfast and one when they saw Linda said, well, where are you headed this morning? She said, I'm headed to Whitehorse. <laughs> That's when he, he said, no way. This pass is dangerous in weather like this. You can never get there in that little Honda Civic of yours. To which she said, well, I'm determined to try. That's when the other trucker said, then I guess we're going to have to hug you. <laughs> and, and Linda took offense. She said, you're not going to touch me. And the trucker started laughing and said, no, I'm not talking about that way. Then we'll have to get one of us in front of you and another truck behind you. Then in all this fog, and if there's any snow, you can keep your eyes focused on those red lights in front of you and know from the headlights that are behind you that you're still on the road, that you're still on your way. You and I, that we're surrounded, we're surrounded by fans. Yes, they're the folks that have gone before us. But we're surrounded by fans in the here and now as well. It is Jesus who rose from the grave and it's his family, the church. When we're baptized, we're baptized into the family of God. We're baptized the way that the New Testament says into the body of Christ, that we're surrounded, that we're surrounded, that we're hugged, that it's folks pulling for you that are in front of you it's folks that are pulling for you and keeping you in the way behind you so often we get confused and and think that personal means private and faith yes it's personal but it was never intended to be private that's why we're baptized into the family of God and this morning it may be that you're since you're separated and that you're alone get on the phone or it may be someone there in your house. Start with a blessing, with a prayer. 
Start with giving of thanks, of praise. That it's when we get to thinking that we're alone, that we're by ourselves, that we begin to stumble. It's when we think that we're alone and by ourselves that we get entangled in the sin. When we're alone and, and by ourselves, we think that we have no power at all. We're surrounded. We're surrounded by fans that go before and behind. They're the folks that have gone before. Folks that have fought the good fight. Folks that are pulling for us. But there are also the folks that are around us in the here and now. That are a part of the body of Christ. Make contact. Make connection and don't lose footing. Don't lose footing. You're not alone. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is you're not alone, so don't lose focus. Verse 2 says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. That is fixing our, our eyes, fixing our focus on Jesus is how you stay in the way, how we stay on the path, how we go, don't get distracted. Sports are a, a great metaphor to talk about the faith. They have a sense of purpose. They have a sense of discipline. In 1990, the Braves were playing the Mets. And if you didn't recognize it, I'm talking about baseball now. <laughs> the Braves were playing the Mets and David Cohn was pitching for the Mets. He threw a ball to the batter, a Braves batter, and the Braves batter hit it between first and second base. Well, the first baseman was pulled off the bag to field the ball. Well, in a play like that, that's when the pitcher, David Cohn, was supposed to come off the mound and, and take the, the throw from the first baseman and, and tag first base. Well, that's exactly what David Cohn did, except the umpire called the runner safe, said that David Cohn didn't tag the bag. David Cohn went berserk and he started arguing with the umpire. Well, that's when the runner realized that David Cohn was holding on to the ball and he wasn't paying attention to him at all. So the, the Braves runner continued to run around. Two Braves runs scored while David Cohn was arguing with the umpire <laughs> and the Braves won the game. I like stories like that. I like stories like that a lot. But that's what happens when we get destructive distracted. That's what happens when we lose focus. Scripture is telling us here, our focus is Jesus. He's the author. He's the one that started faith. Our focus is Jesus. He's the one that perfects us in faith. So often we get distracted by someone who's not doing what they ought to be doing. We get distracted by someone who's done to us what we wish they hadn't have done, an, an injustice. So often we get distracted by the voices that are pulling us away from Jesus Christ. The voices that are, that are loud and saying, pay attention over here, and we lose our focus. Sometimes it's, it's someone who's who says that they're Christian and they're not doing Christian kinds of things, will know that being better than, than someone never grew faith in anyone. Being better than someone never grew faith in anyone. That Jesus is the author. Jesus is the perfecter of faith. Focusing our eyes on injustice, someone that's hurt us, it never grew righteousness in anyone. That keeping our eyes on a cause, even as good and wonderful as the cause may be, it's not Jesus Christ. And it never grew faith in anyone. It's easy to lose focus by the sights and the sounds, the distractions around us, by the hurt, by the pain by the temptation to look at someone with a worse record rather than looking to Christ. 
Hebrews 2.18 says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus knows what it's like to be hurt. Jesus knows what injustice is. Jesus knows what it's like to be, to be called away from God to, to do what's good. As a matter of fact, the very temptation from the devil was to change the stones to bread. Do something good. But good and Jesus are not necessarily the same thing. Don't lose focus. Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me. And he rose. He rose that he might live his life through us. And not only that, we're surrounded by fans. Fans, those that have gone before. Those that are cheering us on. Those that are saying you can do it. Some of those have died and gone before and some of those are surrounded us today. Don't lose focus. Don't lose focus. But not only that, the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is don't lose heart. Verse 3 says, For consider him who has endured such hostilities by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Don't lose heart. Joyce Halliday tells a story about a teacher who was assigned to teach students who were either homebound or, or in the hospital. She would get her assignments by the homeroom teacher of that student, by that child, and, and she would go to their home or go to the hospital to teach them. Well, there was a teacher that wanted to make sure that one of her students didn't fall behind while they were teaching nouns and adverbs. And so she called this, this teacher to go to the, a certain hospital room to teach this little boy nouns and adverbs. It was her job. She went to the room, and right before she knocked on the door, she realized she was in the burn unit. She wasn't prepared at all for what she was about to see. This little boy was badly burned. And here she was trying to get him to pay attention to nouns and adverbs. And she was, she was apologetic about having to teach this little boy nouns and adverbs when he was in such great pain. She said they struggled through it and at the end of the time she went home. It wasn't until the next morning that one of the nurses said, what did you say to him yesterday? Well, she started to apologize that I'm, I, I know he was in great pain and I'm sorry I, that I, but before she could say anything, the nurse said, whatever you said, it made all the difference. She said, we were worried about him that he had given up. But ever since you met with him, it made all the difference. He's begun to try. He's begun to live. Well, later they talked to the little boy. He said that he thought he was going to die. That it wasn't until the teacher came to teach him nouns and adverbs that he started to think about it. And he said, they wouldn't send a teacher to teach nouns and adverbs to someone who was going to die, would they? And that's when I knew I was going to live. Hope. Hope. Hope, it gives heart. Hope gives courage. Hope gives a new start, a fresh start, and hope has a name. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's there beside us. That we're surrounded by the hope of Jesus Christ. That those who've gone before, they're our fans, and they're cheering us on. They've made that struggle in faith, and they're saying, you can do it to give us hope. Jesus Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit, he's living in us and through us. He says, you can do it. Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit in the church, has surrounded us in front and behind to give us heart. This morning, I don't know where it is that you are. I don't know what it is that you're going through. But I know that Jesus Christ gives hope. 
the very hope that, that, that you and I need to have heart, to have heart, to have courage, and to have strength. It may be that you've gotten distracted and that you've lost your focus, that the voices around you and maybe somebody that's doing what they ought not be doing. And, and you've been begin to compare yourself to that person. At least I'm not as bad as they are. And a focus on someone never grew faith in anyone. That our focus is Jesus Christ. He's the one that's a, the author and the perfecter of faith. Or it may be that this morning you lost your footing. You lost your footing. That you had a sense of being alone. And you thought that a private faith meant, a personal faith meant a private faith. Jesus never intended you to go it alone. He surrounded you and me with fans. Fans, yes. Those people who've gone before us in the faith. Yes, fans, Jesus Christ who lives his life through us. And yes, Jesus Christ in the church, the family of faith that surrounds you today. And I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you right now. Jesus gives us the strength we don't have to reach out. That this... This personal faith might not be a private faith, but it might reach out to someone, someone that we might journey together and not lose our footing. We need your strength. We also know that this is a day and an age where there are voices calling to us out there that aren't your voice. Oh, they may be calling us to good, or they may be calling us just not to be bad as someone else. Or they may be voices that are calling us to to a cause that's a good cause, but it's not you. Jesus, give us eyes to see and to focus on you ears that are focused and attentive to you that we might not lose heart that we might know your strength not one day but this day I'm thankful I'm thankful for the way that you've used this church and continue to use your Holy Spirit to grow us all it's in Christ's name we pray Amen Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.